It's a strange scenario. A small comet hits the Earth, as millions of them have during the history of our planet, and the response of our civilization is promptly to self-destruct. Maybe it's unlikely, but it might be a good idea to understand comets and collisions and catastrophes a little bit better than we do. Now, a comet, at least as far as we understand them today, is made mostly of ice. Water ice, maybe some ammonia ice, a little bit of methane ice. So, in striking the Earth's atmosphere, a modest cometary fragment will produce a great radiant fireball and a mighty blast wave. It'll burn trees and level forests and make a sound heard around the world, but it need not make a crater in the ground. Why? Because the ices in the comet are all melted in the impact, and there's going to be very few recognizable pieces of comet left on the ground. Imagine you, that there's a, a block of ice the size of a football pitch weighing a million tons, solid ice. There's no way a, a, a piece of ice that big would not make a crater. It would make a crater. Yeah, and it wouldn't have gone for miles and miles and miles. It would just probably just fraction in the area. Um, so I'm, I'm not buying what Carl Sagan's saying on that. Uh, and it's interesting that. It was more than 20 years before anybody went from the West, went over there to investigate what went on. Um, and there were reports of lots of ice and a big pool of ice um, in the area. It's also interesting to note that in 1908, Nikolai Tesla uh, was testing his, his death ray. And apparently he was, he was aiming it towards the North Pole, which is not too far away from Siberia. And if you study the flat earth, um, then there's a theory that as you get higher, we all know it gets colder. They tell you the temperature outside an aircraft is whatever, minus 40, minus 50 degrees. Um, and when you study flat earth theory, um, you'll see that the, the earth does have a ceiling. Yeah? And there could be ice on the ceiling. So Nikolai Tesla's death ray could have hit the ice and fractured it. And brought a load tumbling down and that would come down in blocks of ice rather than one huge bit it would fracture and come down in bits just a bit like your refrigerator you know when you defrost in the freezer it, it drips a bit and then it comes comes crashing down oops um and it's interesting to note all the book of revelations yeah the bible from the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds. It was actually a weight known as a talent. It's a biblical measure, and that's about uh, 75 pounds. Uh, the book of Revelations is foretelling what is to come. Fell on people, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because of the plague was so terrible. And that's in all the Bible translations, revelations, as to what is to come. So maybe this was a precursor of what is about to befall us. And it's also interesting to note that since the 1940s, on a worldwide basis, they have been building underground cities all over the world. And there's lots of evidence of that. You can see it on YouTube and eyewitness accounts. So they are building these cities down there using the, the money, their, their, you know, their black ops budgets with these high speed rail links and things like that. So maybe they know something. Maybe they know that this ice ceiling at some point is going to come down maybe it's at a time that they decide it's going to come down by you know after Nikolai Tesla died in his hotel room the FBI came in and confiscated all his research so maybe they have got their hands on this technology now for the death ray and the, you know they could precipitate the uh, all this ice coming down on the entire planet on the entire earth I shouldn't say planet and um, they'll be safely tucked up underground and we'll be all left on the surface with all this ice coming down. So it's an interesting thought that that could be what's going on. And if that is the case, are the chemtrails, are they there to 
bring this catastrophic event closer, i.e. the chemicals causing the ice to, to, to come down quicker, or are the, are the chemicals, if there are any, there to delay all this impacted ice coming down? You know, as you look in your fridge, look in the ice compartment, yeah? It builds up and up and up until it's almost full, doesn't it? If you check in your fridge. So, and then the question is then, I know I'm going on to the flat earth here, but if it's not aircraft that are doing it, because they must have been, you know, if it was aircraft, general aircraft that were doing it, involving thousands of civilians, because you can't avoid using civilians, and there's no evidence whatsoever, then it's got to be something else. Now, maybe it's God's janitors, yeah, with their high-tech craft, who are spraying this stuff, and maybe they're making it look like airplanes to, to make people think that it's something else, so that there is an explanation for all these lines in the sky, I don't know. But it's a possibility, and uh, um, it remains to be seen. But if you look at the, the sale of uh, underground shelters, then uh, they're going through the roof. The wealthy people have all got them in their back gardens. And they only talk about all these people stocking up with years' supply of food for some cataclysmic event that's supposed to happen at some point in the future. So my view is that the, 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 the chemtrails are either a psyop to scare you, to induce fear, and to distract you from all the other bad things that are going on, or it's a means to bring forward or delay ice coming down from the sky. And that's why nobody seems to know what's going on. And the stuff that they're putting out is unfounded. So, part two, we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at the flat earth and as a prelude to that, I'm going to, I've been talking to this guy called Mark Sargent. Mark Sargent is the guy who has been on countless radio shows since he released his uh, series of videos called Flat Earth Clues. And I've been in touch with him myself and actually help, helped him make one of them and provided some of the, uh, the information for it. So I'm just going to play um, his introduction before we move on to part two and we look at the Flat Earth. This is a Reader's Digest version containing many of the interesting parts of the Flat Earth Theory. For those who have already started seeing things with new eyes, it will be mostly a recap, but there could be a few new angles you haven't looked at. For the rest of you who are new to this, the first question is invariably, is this a joke? Because it's a joke, right? And that's where we start, because it's one of our two basic childhood facts. One plus one equals two, and the Earth is a globe. We're taught this before almost everything else, and that right there should give you a clue on how serious this secret is. But for those who have forgotten their history, here's the modified Men in Black version. For the first 4,000 years of our civilization, we believed that the Earth was a flattish disk surrounded by a solid dome barrier called the firmament. All of the five major religions had their own version of this, and the churches enforced the belief. Then, around 1514, a man named Copernicus created a new model of the world. He stated that if the Earth was spinning around 1,100 miles an hour and circling the Sun at 60,000 miles an hour, the world was then round. And while the math more or less worked, there was a problem. It was 1500, and the technology to prove such a theory wasn't there. The first balloon to carry people wasn't invented until 1760. Sailboats were the only travel over water, and the fastest thing on land was a horse. But the new worldview was promoted and took hold. The religions adapted to handle the new reality, and life moved on. More importantly, the globe model was quickly introduced into the education systems. Over the next 500 years, the challenges to this model faded to the point where the globe was accepted as universally as physical laws such as gravity. Read that again if you didn't absorb it. For 20 generations, people believed that the Earth was round because there was a globe in every classroom they sat in. There was no proof. Hundreds of years went by, and still civilization had no way of proving the theory. Planes were invented around 1900, but until 1957, nothing could go high enough to give a true perspective of where we lived. And that's when everything got strange. 
The United States and Russia both sent up rockets high enough to take decent pictures, and what they saw scared them a great deal. How do we know they were extremely concerned about the sky? Because the U.S. and Russia immediately started firing nuclear weapons straight up, and they kept firing for the next four years. A few things to keep in mind here. First, this was now 1958. Nuclear weapons were very expensive and hard to come by. These also weren't those nominal yield 20 kiloton toys we used on Hiroshima. This was high kiloton to low megaton, and we couldn't get them up fast enough. And the strangeness continued in other places. In 1959, only a year into the atmosphere bombardment, Ten nations, including the United States, made Antarctica off-limits to any colonization. A treaty was put in place, and to this day remains intact. Over 50 nations now have signed off on this treaty. Do you know any treaty that has lasted that long between all industrialized nations? Moreover, do you know any piece of real estate in the world that is owned by no one? You would think, at the very least, one of the large oil companies would use their huge financial resources to explore this region, and yet they don't even petition the idea. The short version of the discovery is this. By 1958, the military had discovered the very solid upper and outer edges of our world, and had to create a way to put up do not enter signs without looking obvious. It was tricky, but if there is one thing I have learned about the authority, it's that nothing is left to chance. Most of the work had already been done for them, so their job was primarily in the details. The sky part of the dome was much higher than commercial air traffic, so the only thing they had to worry about there was the space program, which is immediately militarized. The outer border had the natural benefit of not only an extensive ocean, but a scaling decrease in temperature and a steady increase in iceberg frequency to discourage ships, all leading to a permanently frozen landmass that could not be used for any form of agriculture. This ocean and ice layout had worked well for thousands of years because the technology of the current civilization didn't evolve quickly. Sailors avoided cold weather seas whenever possible, and oxygen levels get low enough to harm people, even on high mountains. The brilliance of the design comes in the simple fact that human males are corrupted by power. Corruption so total, in fact, that they would rather hide the world itself rather than risk their power on it. You could theorize that kings and popes were told of the world a long time ago. Maybe an ancient scroll or book. Perhaps an interdimensional being told the tale of what the world looked like. But this was all but dismissed, because even the most powerful leaders of the day couldn't reach the borders. And if they couldn't, what chance did the general public have? It's one thing to be told of the giant impenetrable dome, but it's a whole different animal when you finally stand right next to it. Then the tough decisions have to be made. Do we keep the secret? And how far are we willing to go to keep the status quo? Once they decided to keep the secret, no expense was spared. The rapid progression of rocketry science had to be addressed quickly, and so the moon missions were created. Matt from the NASA channel was right in his thinking that you needed the moon mission event to stage a picture of the Earth from deep orbit. And that couldn't be more true. Establishing NASA as the frontrunner of space exploration also diverted people who would have otherwise created their own space companies for profit. The best engineers, technicians, and pilots were recruited to the NASA space program. Once there, they were compartmentalized on a need-to-know basis. The astronauts know of the deception and are sworn to secrecy under the penalty of whatever motivates them. Private space programs are discouraged, sabotaged, or absorbed into the NASA fold. Private sector spacecraft are just not going to be allowed for several reasons. The most obvious is the collision with the dome itself. The telemetry data from such a mission would show an impact failure at a certain altitude, and if repeated, would raise questions NASA just isn't prepared to answer. There are three perpetual questions about our world that can't be eliminated, but avoided at all costs. These are the questions you should ask yourself and others if this protective layer is going to be lifted. I'd like to preface this with a thank you to Max Malone, 
a conspiracy hardcore who has a knack for boiling down debates to a single paragraph whenever possible. It was he who said, after over 50 years and thousands of hours of space travel footage, both by NASA and other countries, there is no exterior shot where the astronaut completes the simple act of panning the camera 180 degrees, let alone a full 360 degree sweep. This has never happened on any moon mission, exterior space station, nothing, ever. Statistics will tell you that this would have already happened by accident years ago, but it hasn't, and it won't. This is because of the rule they cannot break, the same rule that applies to television set shows that never show the fourth wall. Why? Because there is no fourth wall. Number two. When you search online for pictures of the Earth from space, 95% of what you will see is a collection of artificial composite shots. In 2000, when I did this search, there was exactly one picture by NASA showing the bottom part of Africa and Antarctica. Now that picture is hidden within hundreds of simulated images. There are HD cameras everywhere and no one is taking a shot of the Earth because you can't get enough altitude to do it. Number three, the commercial air travel routes for the southern hemisphere are wrong. This is an easy thing you can check out in 60 seconds. Take a map reading of the distance between anywhere near Australia and anywhere in South America. It's a straight shot across the South Pacific. Now find your favorite travel site and try to get there non-stop. See what happens. The routes start turning ridiculous. I used to business travel for years and I've never seen anything like it. It's the one thing in the general public world they can't hide, the actual distance between these two places. On a round world, the flight is easy, just a straight shot across an ocean. But on a flat world, it becomes the greatest distance between two points. There are no shortcuts, so they distract you with multiple connections and layovers. It's only blind luck that the United States was in the Northern Hemisphere, Otherwise, the increased traffic would have raised eyebrows by now. I know, I know. It's madness. It's lunacy. There are people who will tell you straight to your face that all the leaders of the world are lizards, and yet these people laugh out loud when you say the words flat earth. I was, and still am, a huge conspiracy guy. I literally ran out of new tin hat topics to research, and I still wouldn't look at this one without embarrassment. But every time I glanced at it, there was something unresolved. And once I saw the near perfection of the whole plan, I was hooked. Do your own homework. Ask the questions. Get past the possibility and see if you can move into an even bigger picture. Like who built the dome and why. That's where it starts to get really interesting. And things start opening up. I know I said years ago that the greater good was something that should be preserved, that JFK, Pearl Harbor, and 9-11 were inevitable. I still believe it, and I understand the decisions. The globe illusion, however, has run its course over the last 500 years. It's time to start again. If that means we end up getting the attention of who or what created this place and force the reset of the world, is that such a bad thing? I put some links in the description that you might want to check out, like the current map projections used by the USGS, the United Nations logo, the Flat Earth Society, high altitude nuclear tests, the Antarctica Treaty, among others. I'm not allowing ratings or comments on this video for several reasons. One, this topic seems to bring out the worst debates because of the initial denial. That, and I've seen dedicated trolls on the Flat Earth Society website who show up every day and say the same thing to new forum members. It's a joke. It's not serious. Nothing to see here. Kind of strange that there are full-time trolls on a site that has less than 500 members worldwide. That being said, please feel free to contact me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or heck, just call 303-494. 6631. I know 
no one uses the actual phone anymore. But I'll answer what I can. Okay, and in part two, I've got some new evidence for you, further proof that you don't live on a ball. So I look forward to that. Have a nice cup of tea and come back. Good. Okay, now I don't know um, whether this audience was here for my presentation last year on the flat earth, but this presentation for the rest of this evening is going to be mostly about aviation, which shows that we do live on a flat earth. But let's just take a look. This is where you're told from a child. Yeah, every classroom has a, a globe when you're a child. But if you look at the globe, where is the only place, if, the, if we are on a ball, where is the only place that you can stand upright? At the North Pole. Yeah? But you're stood upright here, in the UK. Oops. Whatever that is on here. She's, is there. So you should be stood out like that, but you're not. Yeah? So how can somebody on the North Pole and the South Pole both stand upright? It doesn't make sense, does it? When you go on an aeroplane, yeah, I've had lots of aeroplane journeys, uh, mostly to Spain and the Canaries. When you go on a plane, it takes off. 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, it reaches its cruising altitude and the plane stays perfectly level for the remainder of the journey, apart from the last few miles when it comes down to land. But if you look on a ball, apart from on the North Pole, there's no way that a plane can ever fly level. It's either flying up, down, or skew with going across. It's not possible. I've been on lots of long cruises, not recently because I ain't got so much cash. But when you go on a cruise, a will cruise, the boat doesn't sail uphill. It doesn't sail downhill. It's not skewed to one side. But on a bull it would have to be. How does a boat sail around the world without going up and downhill? Cannot. Who said there's an edge? There may not necessarily be an edge. It might be a, an infinite plane for all we know. Nobody's been there, but Antarctica is off limits to all humans. It's guarded by the military because there's something there to see. So either it's an edge or it's an infinite plane. Yeah? Why would they stop people from going there? I can go up uh, Mount Everest and climb the Eiger Mountain, go to the most dangerous places in the world. Nobody's going to stop me. You go to try and get to Antarctica and there'll be armed boats to stop you going on. You can't go there. So let's look at some of the things that are associated with the flat earth. Satellites. Okay. Just a snapshot of the audience. How many of you think that satellites are real? Most of you. Okay. And how many do you think there are up in the sky? There's supposed to be as, as many as 40,000 satellites up in the sky, all on different trajectories. There's no air traffic control for satellites. Now we've had these fiber optic cables and they're still putting up masts for mobile phones all over the world. If satellites were real, these would be obsolete. There would be no need for them. And GPS is not using satellites, it's using ground-based triangulation. The only thing that's changed is they've incorporated computer systems on it. The USGS, the US Geological Survey, do you know what map it uses? It uses the flat earth map. Let's take a look at some logo. Aviation. Aviation Authority. Their logo is some wings around the flat earth, not the ball earth, the flat earth. United Nations. There's no Antarctica on it. Why might that be? IMO. I'm not sure which one that one is. Oh, sorry, the Maritime Organization. That's C. The World Meteorological Organization. They're using the flat earth map. United Nations, we believe. United Nations, we believe the Earth is flat. 
So the logos of all of air, sea, and weather, yeah, they're all using the flat earth map, as is the USGS. They're not using the conventional map. People say, yeah, but I've been on a plane and I looked out of the window and I saw the curve. Let's take a look, shall we? This is from Concord, out of the window. So you're looking out of the window of Concord. If the earth was a ball, yeah, and you're looking out of the window, you're going to be looking down to the horizon. But the horizon is always at eye level. It doesn't matter whether you're on the top of Mount Everest or on the ground, you'll see the horizon at your eye level. If it was a ball, you'd be looking down at the horizon as the Earth curved down. On land, there we are, another aeroplane, flat, another horizon, another horizon. Some of these are, are at uh, 100,000 feet and it's still flat as a pancake. Tops of buildings, that's off the top of Mount Everest, flat. Mount Everest, flat, 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 flat. Everywhere you look, the earth is flat. Problem is, ever since you were a child, you've been conditioned to think that you live on a sphere. You never decided from your own research that you live on a sphere, but because you've had it drummed into you all these years, you accept it as a given, it's not even worth, it's a big joke. Flat earthers are some of the dumbest people on earth. We've even had uh, President Obama, he's getting flat earth incorporated into his speeches now to try and make flat earthers look stupid. Okay, so I looked at cruisers. This is a P&O round the world cruise, and that's where it shows on the conventional map, yeah? And people say, well you can't, how would you sail around the world on a flat earth map? Well, you can actually sail around the world on a flat earth map, and this is the route. So on the flat earth, the boat can sail level all the way round, and it's going around the world, but on the ball earth, it can't. This, is, well, this ball's supposed to be the truth, but on models, aviation, boats, humans, cars, doesn't work. If you look at the shape of the ball, if you were travelling from Scotland down to, uh, to London on a ball, it would be downhill all the way. You wouldn't need to put any petrol in your car. you just use your brakes. But you don't. It's not downhill all the way because it's flat. Now, let's look at aviation. I'm going to show you this little There's a route from Santiago to Sydney. And it's, they've actually used John Travolta to publicise this so-called non-stop flight that flies all that way without stopping. And it's supposedly taking 14 hours and 12 hours on the way back. But you can't book it because myself and several friends on Facebook, we've actually gone through the motions of going onto the flight booking sites and tried to book these flights. We weren't going to pay for it. But we just wanted to see how far we could get. And you get so far, and then all the boxes grey out. You've seen boxes greying out on the internet. So you can't press on it, and you can't get any further. So these flights are bogus. So it's four, oops, sorry, 14 hours, they say. Okay. Don't say. Okay. So then you look at this one. This is a two-stopper. So 99% of the published flights are two stoppers or even three stoppers. And you look at how long it takes. This is broken down 43 hours, 30 minutes. Yeah. Now, if you look at this particular flight here, yeah, from Santiago to Sydney, first of all, it goes from Santiago to Texas and flies 4,652 miles. And then it goes from Texas to San Francisco, 1,641 miles. So it's done 6,300 miles. You look at the distance it's got to do on the last leg, it's 7,426 miles. 
Now, how far was the distance on the non-stop? Did you look at that? So it's, it's done the best part of 7,000 miles, and he's still got more than 7,000 to go. Well, let's go back and see how far it is non-stop, yeah. according to that. 7,000 miles, 7,048 miles. So it goes 7,000 miles, and it's still got 7,000 to do. So this plane is using, it's flying twice as far, using twice the aviation costs, twice the staff costs, which are all very expensive. And in today's world, they're trying to make planes that are more fuel efficient, believe it or not. You know, because aviation fuel is one of the biggest costs of flying a plane. Let's take a look at how this pans out on the maps. So we've got the flat earth map, yeah, which people will say is a load of rubbish, which is used by the USGS, and your conventional map. Let's see what these routes look like. So, here we have Santiago, South America, yeah, up to that, the, um, the east coast of America, Across to the west coast and down to Sydney. Does that make any sense to you? They're flying twice as the passengers are, you know, it's taking them the best part of three days to get there. If they can get there in 14 hours, why isn't the plane taking the red line? Why don't you think, why, why do you think that plane's going that way? Picking up passengers. Picking up passengers. That would be like a plane, like a bus going down to London, stopping off in Cornwall to pick up passengers. They just wouldn't do it. Let's take a look and see what it looks like on the flat earth map. Does it make any sense? Does anybody think that makes sense on there for a route? If you look at the routes in the Northern Hemisphere, they make sense because the Northern Hemisphere is okay for routes, but it's skewed in the South on the flat earth map. Those lines there are the routes that I showed you on the previous, you know, on the booking. booking. There you go. So now you look at the flat earth map, yeah? Is that starting to make a bit more sense? Yeah, it's virtually a straight line, isn't it? They can't fly it non-stop because it's twice as far. So they take the, the most straight route they can and stop off on the way. Makes every sense on the flat earth map and no sense on the ball earth map. And you can check routes from Africa to New Zealand, um, Australia to Africa, Australia to South America, Every time you're talking two, three stops, yeah, and none of them make any sense on the ball lift, and they're all flying twice as far using twice the fuel if the map was correct, but it's not. Anyway, Mark Sargent made a video, okay, and I'm going to show you the short clues part nine the magic show. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This flat earth perspective initially started out as a problem solving exercise that was going to be built into clue 7, otherwise known as the long haul. But after some research and a little patience, it has evolved into something that warranted its own section and is a perfect example of good things come to those who wait. So emails and phone calls have been coming in, almost all of them positive. Several people from around the world commented on the southern plane routes. They said that while well, 95% of the long routes in that hemisphere were connections, which in itself raises red flags, there were a few pesky non-stops that seemed to contradict the overall logic. The question then posed to me was obviously, are they real flights? Could they be put there to throw the Flat Earth group off? If it was a trick, could I figure out what it was and how it was accomplished? I accepted the challenge and started my impression of Morgan Freeman as he went up against the Four Horsemen magician crew. Now, admittedly, I was skeptical to start because the flights went against the third rule, that being the Flat Earth has no shortcuts only a globe has shortcuts. As in magic, I had to assume the rule was not being broken, but only hidden, or having the illusion of being broken. But first, I had to see the trick itself. I had to see the planes in question, and see them make the route. Anyone can list a flight, but does it actually go from point A to point B? With the help of several other people, this was then put to the test. 
While just about everyone with a cell phone knows about GPS and how it can track things, many people don't know that even though it's a system built by the military, there is a very public aspect to it. So while your phone is tracked at all times, so are other things, most notably all air traffic. Now, if you're military, you could view military planes. If you work at a cargo carrier like UPS or FedEx, you can view transport planes. The general public is mostly limited to commercial air traffic. This can be viewed in several places, and the one I chose was planefinder.net. You can use others like FlightAware, FlightRadar24, Flight Tracker. It makes no difference because they are all tied into the same exact GPS system. All these sites do basically the same thing. Track every commercial plane in the world from start to end in real time. So I spend day after day looking at the Plane Finder global map, which you see here. At any given time, it's tracking between three to 7,000 flights that are en route anywhere in the world. You'll notice two different colors for planes, red and yellow. Yellow just means there's a five minute delay in processing and only applies to the United States. The point here is in order to prove out these flights that go against flat earth theory, I need to watch a few as they cross either the South Pacific or Indian Oceans. The web page updates automatically, but just to be sure, I close and reopen the page every 30 minutes or so and wait for an ocean plane. And I wait. And I wait. And I wait some more. Hours pass. Days pass. And no red planes to entertain me. And somewhere in this process of me just staring at these empty oceans, waiting for a plane to cross, something occurs to me. Can you guess what it is? Nothing is crossing these oceans. Not non-stops, connections, multiple connections, nothing. But that's not possible, right? The planes have to reach their destinations. So I change gears and just watch the coastlines of anything in the southern hemisphere. And I start to see it. I follow a simple plane out of Brazil on its way to South Africa, which, by the way, is not part of the long-haul argument. It's offshore just a few hundred miles. I get something to drink, and when I come back, it's gone. Hmm. Just a glitch, right? So I follow another, and another, and the same thing happens again and again. Once the plane reaches an imaginary line in the water, GPS makes it disappear. Then a friend who is also working on this problem sends me some links, which I've included in the description. I encourage you to take a look at them. At first, they don't seem like much, just an average flight log showing speed, altitude, locations, things you could expect. Then you scroll down to about 3.30 in the morning, and the location drops away, and is replaced by either the word approximate or the word estimated. This then continues for the next five hours until, miraculously, one hour before landing, the flight log reestablishes itself and the GPS system shows the plane in real time about to reach its destination. So to be clear to those who may not be seeing everything here, the flights are being dropped off GPS and their flight data is also turned off and stays off until they are almost on top of their arrival point. And you say, well, that's how GPS works. Well, no, because the Northern Hemisphere has planes flying all over their oceans. And then you say that maybe it's a localized Southern Hemisphere thing. And I say, then why are all the flights over or near land perfectly tracked? Furthermore, this is a U.S.-based system, with Americans flying on vacation every single day. You're telling me that those people aren't going to be tracked? In addition, 
the Vanishing Plain Act is happening to not only the South Pacific and Indian Oceans, which I would expect, but also the South Atlantic, which isn't part of the Flat Earth argument. There are a bunch of flights that cross this relatively small ocean between South America and Africa, and every one of the planes is hidden shortly after takeoff. So then you say, what would be the purpose of hiding those shorter routes in the Atlantic? It's because of something I didn't see right away. If you hide one flight, you have to hide them all. Showing the GPS routes in the Atlantic, but leaving out the Pacific and Indian Oceans would raise different questions. So the logic here, despite being very sneaky, is sound. The third rule is that the Flat Earth has no shortcuts. If you look at the azimuthal equidistant map again, and look close, you notice that while the South Pacific, South Atlantic, and Indian Oceans make up the lower sections on a globe, they make up the outer ring on a flat model. In that model, there is no shortcut between Australia and South America. If you are creating flight routes, you have only two choices. You take the long way around, clockwise or counterclockwise, and stay on the ocean. Or you cut across the land in the middle. But if you cut across the land, you have to create connections, because on a globe, it wouldn't make sense to fly over the top of the United States to get to South America. Neither of these choices are ideal. So the authority came up with a compromise. Disable GPS and lose the planes for every ocean flight in the southern hemisphere. Then reactivate them once the destination is reached. This is just one of the lengths that they are willing to use to keep you from seeing it. Don't just hide some things. Hide everything so that maybe the topic isn't addressed. And some would come back and say, well, nice going. You just pointed out a flaw in their system, and sooner or later, they will fix the gap. Hmm, maybe. But not soon, I think. Remember, this is a rule, not a guideline. They can't change the map, so they have to work within its limitations. If they have a better workaround, I can't wait to see it. So do your own research and ask questions. Oh, by the way, welcome to the Flat Earth and enjoy your flight. So you have a situation where all the Southern Oceans, no flights ever cross them on the flight radar. None at all. It's because they can't do it. It's too far. It's beyond the range of uh, conventional aircraft. So they don't show anything. They couldn't show them anyway because GPS is not satellites, it's ground-based. And these southern oceans are so far apart, it's beyond their range. Let's take a look at some little flight radar shots. There's a few here. And you can see for yourself, I actually stayed up for hours and hours, and you can see these southern oceans, nothing ever flies across. I stood for about 12 hours watching it. Nothing ever flies across them. This is Plane Finder, the one that Mark was using, and you can see this is just another snapshot of these southern oceans. Nothing. And another one. There we are. Absolutely nothing crossing those southern oceans because they can't, it's too far. So, has anybody ever been on a holiday to the Canary Islands? Anybody? Somebody must have. Yeah? Do you remember going and getting on the plane? Yeah. yeah. Was, it, was the flight, was there any turbulence or was it just a, you know, a regular flight? Straightforward flight. So you got in your, you sat in your seat in the plane and it took off and whatever, 20 minutes later it got to its cruising. So the nose was going up until you reached your cruising height, didn't it? Is that what happened? Oh, they might go up and down if there's turbulence, but let's assume that it's calm. 
generally speaking the plane will take off and then you'll be level in your seat the plane will be perfectly level flush with the earth for the rest of the journey is that what happened with you did the nose go up or down until it was time to land you, feel when you, it, you, feel you know it's you know when it's going down don't you yeah so until you got to the canaries did it stay more or less level It stayed level. What about you, Rob? Did it stay level for you? All right, well, I've been to the Canaries probably about 20 times, yeah? And it always stays level. It doesn't dip. Now, how far do you think the Canaries are away from the UK? I'm just using this as an example. 3,000 miles. It's two, about 2,000 miles. Let's have a flight from Glasgow, just for convenience, to Gran Canaria. And you can see that it is... 2,006 miles, yeah, and the direction for that 2,006 miles is more or less south, yeah, mm -hmm. there's a map of the route, more or less south, so it's coming down the earth on this fall, yeah, mm -hmm. where's the UK, it's there, and it's coming down off the west, sorry, yeah, off the west coast of Africa, the plane's coming down, so the plane has to descend to get down the ball. Now using conventional maths to work out how much it would need to come down over that distance, this is a standard formula for the Earth. It's 8 inches times the number of miles squared. So it's 8 inches times 2,000 times 2,000. So we all know that 1,000 squared is a million. So 2,000 squared is 4 million. 4 million times 8 is 32 million inches. And that works out at just over 500 miles. So over that journey between the UK and the Canaries, the plane, to take account of the curvature of the Earth, which most of you think you live on, the plane has got to come down 500 miles. That's conventional maths. The Earth is a ball after all. But it doesn't. And the plane would have to be coming down, the nose would need to be down for the entire journey. For every mile that plane travelled, it would need to descend a quarter of a mile to actually get, to get down and land. Of course, when you got to the airport, the, uh, the runway was flat, wasn't it? But you can't have flat runways on a ball, can you? You know, you'd be taking off downhill, wouldn't you, on a ball? Would you not? How would you get a flat runway on a ball? Somebody tell me, how do you get a flat airport? You'd have to dig into the earth, wouldn't you? You'd have to carve it into the earth and then fly out like you're, you know, like you're the Starship Enterprise. So that proves that the earth is flat. Because you don't come down and down and down for the entire journey. But you'd have to. Okay. Planets. Somebody give me a planet. Mercury. Mercury. Okay. Does anybody believe that there is actually a, a spherical planet, this sort of shape, called Mercury? Solid ball somewhere. You believe that? Yeah. Why, why, why do you believe that? You've been told. Yeah. You've been told. Well, what, 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 what evidence do you have? to prove that, that, that this place called Mercury exists? Only, Only what you've been told. So you've got no evidence of your own that it exists other than what... Seen you, you've seen it. You saw a little bit of light in the telescope. Yeah, you didn't see a, a huge ball. Not a huge ball, no. OK, but we've had all these space probes, have we not? Yeah, apparently. NASA sends space probes up every year all over the solar system, do they not? Yeah. So, all, and, you know, the camera has been invented, has it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Well, why aren't there any photographs? Why are there no photographs? They're not real, they're composites. And NASA admit the photographs are composites. Let's have a look if you go and see what's on Mercury. If you go online and search for photographs. Some of these are NASA's, but none of them are real. And look, got these photographs of Mercury, and they're all different. That's really weird, isn't it? Let's have a look. I mean, 
That, that looks a bit like a bowling ball to me. Have anybody been temping bowling? Yeah? I had a bowling ball like that once. So that's one picture. Oh, there's another. Does that look exactly the same? You'd think it would, wouldn't you? Let's have a look at another one. That's different again. And another one. And another one. This one time it's gone red. And back to the bowling ball. Somebody give me another planet. Mars. Okay, let's have a look at Mars. Of course, you've all seen the squirrel on Mars, have you not? From NASA's official photographs. Have you seen the squirrel? Do you think they were on Mars? Don't think so. A bobcat. All right. Isn't it funny on that picture there? You can see the Earth quite clearly like that. If that was the case, you'd be able to see Mars just the same because the Earth is bigger than Mars. But you can't. Oh, it's changed colour again. Colour different again. Different again. Oh, look at that. You can see the Earth's moon from Mars. Somebody give me another planet. Saturn. Saturn. The rings of Saturn. Most of these pictures that you see, in fact, all of them, none of them are real. They're just artist depictions. They're impressions of what it might look like if we ever got to see it. But nobody's been there and no space probe has been there. Otherwise, you'd have some real photographs. So you look at this picture, and you've got all this stuff in the background. Let's look at the next one. Different colour again. Totally black on this one. There's no stars in the background on that one. Different angle this time. Shadows this time. So if you go online and look for pictures of the Earth, and the stars, and the planets, you won't find any. They're all artists' impressions at best. Lawrence, I must admit, I, uh, I must admit, I have actually seen uh, the ring Saturn and its rings through my own telescope. Oh, yeah, you can see something like that, but it's just a tiny bit of light. Yeah, it, tiny. it might be a bit of light that's got a ring around with it. Yeah, it looks about that. Yeah, I know, I've, see, I've seen those, yeah. Yeah. But nobody's been there. And, it, and if, if NASA have sent probes there, you'd have these beautiful photographs. And you've got the Hubble telescope. So you check at the back, what were you going to say? They were. They're false. All false, yeah. False. NASA lie about everything. They wouldn't point, they wouldn't point Hubble at, uh, Why? Well, this is the Hubble. Now, the Hubble telescope is a joke. It doesn't exist. There is no Hubble telescope. There are no telescopes. You look at that. It's covered in tin foil. It's just a toy. It's just a mock-up. Come on, does that look real to you? Sure. Why? Yes. The, re the reason they want you to think the world, what they want you to think is that we're a tiny speck in a vast universe and we're insignificant, yeah? Whereas the Earth is the centre of all that is. Everything that you're shown that's supposedly from outside the Earth is false, it's been made up. So that's why people don't give a shit. It's all each man for himself. Because there's nobody watching over you. There is no God. They want a godless world or a creator. Can you imagine if it became public knowledge that there were boundaries to the earth, which would mean it had to have been created by somebody, yeah? Evidence of a creator, evidence of God. If people knew that somebody was watching over you, then all the crimes are going to stop. Because they know there's a God watching over them, or, or Creator. So they want you to think that you're, we're nothing, we're nobody in a vast space that goes on forever. What evidence do you have that there is a God? What evidence can you convince me that there is a God? You insist that there is one. I'm, I'm not saying there's a God, I'm saying that, that the Earth was made, it was created. And that's why you can't go beyond Antarctica, because why there's something... Pardon? Who created it? Who? 
something that's got vastly more power than what we have. But the evidence is there in the, in the creation of the earth. They don't want you to see it. If you, there's, uh, Mike Degree, yeah, he was a marine biologist and he went down in his submarine and the Bible talks about firmaments, which are like different layers. And when he went down, I haven't got the clip with me today, but you can find it on YouTube. When he went down, he saw an ocean beneath the ocean, but it was impenetrable. It was so super sailing, the submarine couldn't go beyond it. That is the waters beneath the earth, and there's waters above the earth. They talk about this in the Bible. So you'd rather believe a 2,000 year old document that was written by people? If it was evidence, if you, it, why don't you think they want to let you go to Antarctica? It's because there's an edge there. There's a, there's a barrier. There's something there that will confirm the existence of a creator. Do you think we might focus on a petri dish then in, a, in some labs? And we could be in a snow globe on somebody's desk, yeah. How do you explain the sunrise and the sunset? Okay, let's, let's talk about sunrise and sunsets. Okay. The sun appears to rise, but it doesn't. It's at the same height. It's perspective. So it appears to be highest when it's by you. If you look down a railway line, you'll see it narrow into the distance, and you'll see the railway pilot, the, ra the telegraph lines going down into nothing. They're not getting smaller, it's just that your range of vision has what's called a vanishing point, after, you know, which is where the horizon is, which is about three miles. You can't see beyond that. And all the sun does, it goes outside your range of vision. It's always there. And then it comes round in its circle and comes back again. So if you look at a railway line, yeah? Do you think that railway line's bending over the curve of the earth? It's not. Engineers don't make any allowance whatsoever for the curvature of the earth. But you can't see beyond three miles on that railway line. And it's the same with the sun. You can't, yeah, same with the sun. You won't, pardon? It doesn't, no, but the, the Creator can do anything He likes with the sun. The Creator can do anything He likes. You're talking about somebody, if somebody can create an, an entire earth, then what appears in the sky, yeah, what they can do is way beyond what you could comprehend. The sun does appear at different sizes from different parts. Sometimes the sun is further away, and when it's apparently getting to going down, it gets larger. How would you explain that on a ball earth? You couldn't explain it. I mean, you look at this like this space agent, SpaceX. They hide things in place in plain sight. SpaceX. What does an X mean? No. They're not going anywhere. Let's look at the sun. Okay. Now, conventional science is going to tell you that the sun is 93 million miles away. You were taught that at school, weren't you? I was taught that. Like, if you ask you in your exam, how far away is the sun? It's 93 million miles. Everybody knows that. How do you know it? Because somebody told you. But what, they also, what conventional science will also tell you, even NASA, even Carl Sagan, they will tell you that the sun's rays, when they hit the Earth, will be parallel. Because they've got to travel... 93 million miles. They're not going to be coming out at odd angles, otherwise they wouldn't get Only straight lines are going to hit the Earth. You look at those sun's rays there, yeah? You've got a 45 degree angle there. And what that means is the sun is very close. It's only about 3,000 miles away. If you look at the sun and the moon, have you noticed the sun and moon are the same size as an observer? Have you noticed that? Yeah? They're the same size. But what a big coincidence. The sun is 400 times bigger than the moon because it's 400 times further away. Yeah? That's why, the, that's why official science tells you. They've got all these very wonderful coincidences. But you, don't, you cannot get sun rays coming like that, yeah? From 93 million miles away. It's impossible. If you look, that sun's going down, yeah? yeah. If, that, if that sun was 93, that sun was 93 million miles away, yeah, you're not going to get a lot of those angles. 
Uh, and if you look, you've got a line of sunlight coming from the sun, yeah, all the way to the shore. Can you see the line of sunlight coming to the shore, folks? You can see that, can't you? But if the sun was 93 million miles away, that light would need to bend round the curvature of the Earth. The only way you can have sunlight over the Earth is with the sun that's close by above the Earth. It ain't 93 million miles away. How far away is it then? It's about 3,000 miles away. And it's only about 35 miles across. Yeah, with a, if you use one of those um, chron chronoscope things. What happened with the eclipse of the sun about 15 years ago? Yeah, that, we, they reckon that there may be what's called the black sun in the sky which causes it. Well, they, I mean, I don't think astronauts have ever got... Or when you see a rocket being launched, there's nobody on them. You know, you know the Challenger? Do you remember the Challenger? All those astronauts are still alive. They're all working in universities and colleges. I haven't brought the photographs with me, but I can show they're all still alive, and some of them kept the same names, and a couple of them were claiming to be the twin brother. Those Challenger astronauts are still alive. Nobody was on that aircraft, but they had to kill them off in the public to maintain the illusion. You can go and check it out yourself. Challenger astronauts still alive, and it'll tell you individually pictures of them then, and now you can tell it's the same purpose. They've got a few grey hairs, and they've got a few wrinkles on their face, but they're the same people. They're not dead because they didn't get on board that ballistic missile. They were. Now he's already tried. He bounced off the off the, the upper limits. I haven't got the film with me, but I could show. If you actually go out, if you type in glass ceiling, if you type in flat earth glass ceiling, yeah, you will see Richard Branson's spacecraft, yeah, you'll, you'll see the, the, it, uh, the, the exhaust coming out, and then it will all cut out, and it comes down. You can't get there. There's a barrier, there's an upper barrier. Nothing's ever left the earth. All the, that's why all the pictures you see are artist depictions. They're pretending that you're going into outer space. Pardon? Yeah, but he don't know. Look, do you remember watching the BBC when the news was coming on? For years and years and years, you got this frigging globe. This is just to get the globe in your mind. You still haven't explained why they want this picture. You said it's to keep us in the dark and to show what's the advantage of that. Of what? Because they want you to, th because these are evil people, they want you to think you're insignificant. Yeah? So, I don't know. But that's what that. This is one of the latest memes, yeah, that they discovered off, off, um, off, um, off Jupiter. Dinky Dinky Donkey, it's called. I, I mean, they show you things like that. That's just a piece of pumice stone. This is what they, they just show models of bits of rock and say this is a planet. There, there was a documentary that came out, I don't know whether you saw it, <coughs> and it was called The Lie We Live because they're trying to get this ball earth, flat earth type thing into your psyche. And this documentary, it was about nine minutes long, and it was called The Lie We Live, yeah? And it was all about making it out, it was all about how horrible things are on, on earth. But it wasn't about that really, it was about the ball earth, trying to make you think the earth is a ball. And if you watch this, I'll put the, the, uh, the pictures on. There we go, manage. And you know, this is, this is, this is just a selection over, um, over eight minutes. I've just picked these few out. You have a look, this is what, these are what's coming up. Some of them are subliminal, yeah? This was nothing about flat earth, but look at these images that you're getting. The lie we live, check it out. Yeah, does that look flat to you? So it goes from flat, to a curved road, to flat again, flat as a pancake, flat, flat, a, a bendy bridge, curved bridge. They're showing you the contrast between flat and curved just to confuse you. 
it's to play with your mind. And then you've got somebody stood on a ball, yeah? What's that got doing in, in something that's nothing to do with the flat earth? A flat beach with dead fish? A circular flat, flat disc? And some of these pictures of the ball earth were sublimable, so they were only in for a, a split second. Flat as a pancake again. These were burgers, but it, this, it's symbolic of being the flat earth. And then in, in a shop. There was hundreds and hundreds of images. So take a look at that. Now you've got this earth, okay? We've got this earth. And it's spinning round. And it tilts. And it's also got some other motions. Yeah, Let's look at the, the, the so-called motions of the so earth. So the earth is supposedly... Spin, well, if you add the spin together and the speed it travels around the, the sun, 69,000 miles an hour. That's about 90 times the speed of sound we're going at, just around the sun. Yeah? Can anybody feel the spin? Anybody? Can you feel the spin in this room? Anybody? Can anybody feel it? Can anybody feel the spin? No. But you believe it's spinning, don't you? Because you've been educated to believe. The Earth is motionless. It ain't going anywhere. And then the Earth is apparently travelling 43,200 miles an hour towards Lambarda Hercules. But it's also travelling 15,624 miles an hour perpendicular to galactic plane. And also going 446,400 miles an hour Orbiting the galactic centre, giving a total speed of 574,000 miles an hour. Yeah? And most people believe all this bullshit. So if the Earth was going half a million miles an hour, and the Earth's been here for four and a half billion years, why are all the stars, or what appear to be stars, they always say in the bloody same place? Not an, not an ounce of movement. They're always in the same place. It's impossible. But it works on a flat earth. They have moved over the thousands of years. They have moved years. They've hardly moved at all. If we were going at... If, we're going, if, you're going, if you're going at half a million miles an hour, then over a few years, they're going to look a whole lot, lot different. And the only way they get away with that is saying that the stars are like trillions of miles away. They just make this shit up. They're just blobs of light. They're bits of light through the, the Earth's glass ceiling. And then we've got... I mean, who believes in gravity? You believe in gravity. Why do you believe in gravity? Can you tell me the mathematical, mathematical formula for gravity? Anybody tell me the mathematical formula for gravity? I'll tell you what, I've looked for it on the internet trying to find out Einstein's maths for it. It ain't there. But, you, but this guy called Einstein discovered it, didn't he? He must have been a no, fucking... So, sorry, uh, uh, Newton, sorry, I should have said. He was, must have been a real genius. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at some of Newton's work, shall we? There's weight, density. density. A little, uh, one of these... Uh, um, little seed caps of a dandelion can just drift up, can't it? Gravity is so powerful that it can hold a man by his boots on the base. Yeah, but it'll let a little seed pod drift away. It's amazing, and, and of course you can only have gravity on something that's really big like the Earth. You can't make a model of it. That's weird, isn't it? Well, let's have a look at this Isaac. Is some of the most fabulous work of Isaac Newton. Yeah, these are his musings. Vegetables. Suppose that ye pour of a vegetable filled with fluid, maker of and globule a yolk, rough away ye particle, and rest of subtle, more let in ye pour mist from a towards but by the mass juices continually dry from its roots of trees upwards and juices, pleasing dregs in ye pours and wanking passages, sketch your pores and wait before they. This is the guy that discovered gravity. You believe him? 
Come on. This, this is the guy. And everything since he invented it, you've believed it. Gravity, you know. And, and, and the earth. And water. All right, let's get, if, we, if we've got a big long trench in this room and we filled it full of water, would it curve? Would the water curve anybody? No. no. So why would it curve on a ball? What happens to something when it spins that's covered in water? What happens? Eh? That's what happens. Wet tennis ball. All the water would just shake off. And don't forget, it's going at half a million miles an hour. How is any water going to stay on it? And then, if you check official science, they're going to tell you that this planet, this Earth, 4.5 billion years old. Wow. That's a long time, isn't it? Four point. And of course, if you listen to uh, Brian Cox, he'll say it was all bits of dust that came together. Well, that's a bit weird because the Earth is supposed to be molten in the middle. How do bits of dust turn into, into a molten centre? How does that work out? Pressure. Huh? How did that work out? So, so 4.5 billion years, but it's still red hot down there. How long is it going to take to cool down? I actually worked it out. If the entire Earth had cooled from the inwards outwards, yeah, for 4.5 billion years, it would have, uh, about just over an inch a year, it would have cooled down. That's not much, is it? You know, if you've got a big ton block of molten metal, yeah, a week later it'd be stone cold, wouldn't it? So, reality never mirrors what they tell you. Their science cannot be mirrored in reality. Everything they tell you is complicated maths that no bugger understands. But they're wearing a white coat and they're scientists, so you believe them. But they're lying to you. And then you've got a little dandelion flower, yeah? That can just float away. You've got this gravity, it can hold a man in Australia upside down. 200 pound man. But it can't hold that down, can it? That's weird, isn't it? The atmosphere works on everybody. This is, the, this is the theory from gravity. Somebody actually wrote it down. Do you get that? That's gravity for you. Yeah? Where would you start looking at that? Huh? You'd think, yeah, sounds complicated. It must be right. I'm not going to try and work that out. Yeah. Man has only been down eight miles. So when you get these... When I was at school and we did... We did geography and we did the cross section of the earth and all the different layers of magma and the molten bay. But man's only been down eight miles. seen the International Space Station? Thinks they've seen it. Oh, I think I've seen it. Well, if you've got a plane flying ten miles up, huge jumbo jet, yeah, about the same size, about the same size as the International Space Station. Actually, yeah. Yeah? yeah, yeah, and it's a little tiny dot. But the space station's like two hundred miles up, so you won't be able to see anything. Let's take a look at Manchester United football ground, shall we? And see where it, this is just on Google Earth. Google Earth don't have satellites, by the way. They use planes. They pretend to have satellites for the higher one, but they're just CGI. So you look at Manchester United. There we go. Anybody recognise the ground? Yeah? So that's from so high. And then you go a bit higher. Little tiny dot. And a bit higher. I've just put this one over here, which is bigger, so you can see a point of reference. And then you go a bit higher. Yeah? Barely see it there. You can see the roads and stuff, but you can't see... Because the football ground's about the same size as the, ice, the International Stage Station, apparently. It's not reflecting sunlight. Okay, and then you go a bit higher. Ah, mm. oh, oh, tiny, and a bit higher. But you're supposed to be able to see this ISS coming across. It's probably just something that they've... You know, a drone plane or something lit up over there. Because there isn't an International Space Station. It's filmed on the ground. I showed this last time, yeah? You can look at the footage of the International Space Station where they're supposed to be working out in space repairing the International Space Station. But you're getting air bubbles. It's because they're filming it in underwater tanks. One guy dropped his tool bag and you saw it fall down onto the false earth. And then on one of the... the um, International Space Stations, they got a live feed with an audience. So they were supposed to be up in space, and the audience were on the ground. But the guy up in space, these are not astronauts, by the way, they're actonauts. They're pretending to be actors. 
and he let slip that they weren't in space, they were in Maine, USA, on the ground, not in space. If you just type in ISS, International Space Station hoax, there's loads of footage about NASA. NASA's faking everything. You must have watched the rockets going up. The rockets go up, and after 30 seconds, they're like that. And they're always flying over the bloody sea. Why do you think that is? They're not going up into space. Space is up. They're flying over the sea because they ain't going anywhere. It's just a show for you. And then they have cameras on them. And they show you the first minute. And then camera cuts out. Wouldn't you like to see the, 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 uh, the spacecraft going, bursting through the atmosphere and seeing all the magnificence of outer space? Well, you never bloody well see it because they don't go there. How long do you think the ceiling is that? It's about 100,000 uh, about 10 kilometres. And then they try and get this in your mind. You look at this graffiti, yeah? They said it was flat. Obama, he's putting in his speeches now. It's everywhere. This is getting out now. Lots, thousands of people. If you look at, when I did my last talk on chemtrails, it was about 100,000 videos about chemtrails. Now there's millions, yeah, four years later. And if you look on flat earth, there's thousands being, by individuals who find out the earth is flat, some of them are freaking out. And there's over a hundred thousand videos on YouTube now, just on the flat earth. And then you've got another one. What Jesus really taught. It was a ball earth, and he didn't, he didn't teach that. And then you've got here, the world is flat, Volkswagen. Well, if you listen to, if you listen to Neil Armstrong's speeches, yeah, he actually tells you, if you, if you I, could, I haven't brought them in tonight, but he's actually hinting, he's, if you read these words, because he's having some of these descriptors, he's telling you about the edge. He says it get, gets a bit hair-raising when you get to the edge. And then he talks about truth's hidden layers. Yeah? So he's, you look at Neil Armstrong at the press conference after the uh, Apollo 11, yeah? and he, he looks like someone's just shot his dog. They all look sick as a chip. They should have been so happy. It's because they were having to pretend to have gone to the moon. And all subsequent things, they're all faked. And everything that NASA does there is fake. I sat back to your satellites again. Google have got a, pla got a fleet of planes to get all their photographs. But if they've got this, all these satellites up there, why do they need planes? They've got a fleet of submarines as well, apparently. Eh? I don't know. And then you've got the seabed. The seabed's flat as well. They're doing a Google Ocean thing, yeah? So let me ask you. Okay, we've looked at gravity. Does anybody believe that man has actually been into space? Anybody think he's been into space? You believe NASA? Do you believe NASA? You do? You think they won't lie about everything then? Don't liars tend to lie about everything? They'd have to, wouldn't they? And all these probes that have been out to all these places, some of them have been going there 40 years or so, and still sending photographs back. Yeah? All fake. All these fake pictures from Mars. What's beyond your uh, ceiling and what's outside? Nobody knows, because nobody's been there. You know, and if you sit out in your garden, I was sat out in the garden today. I was watching the sun, moving across, coming over that way. That way. The earth wasn't spinning, I couldn't feel it spinning. But it seemed to me that the earth was coming across, sorry, the sun was coming across the earth. But no, 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 it's the spin of the earth. You know, everything that's opposite is the truth for, for all these pseudoscientists. You've seen shadows on the moon, haven't you? Like, uh, you know, eclipses and things like that. You know, sure yeah, but think about them. The, the Earth, if the Earth is a construct, yeah, it was made, yeah. I mean, I mean could, there could be a, a race of giants that made the Earth. We don't know. You know, we could be in a little Petri dish for all we know. So they could make these things. They could make the Earth. They could, all, if you, look at sun, if you look at moonlight, it's totally different to sun. If the, if the moon is lit up, it's not from the sun. It's a different type of light. The, 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 the light from the moon comes from within it. You may laugh. Where do you think it comes from? Then? It's not, because the light's different. Sunlight and moonlight are totally different. You look at fires. They're totally different. You're talking... You're, you're arguing with me with conventional science, which is a pack of lies. Um, what's your degree? Degrees are not worth the paper they print. You go to university, yeah? 
The square hat. So you're not a scientist then? All the science, most of science is fraudulent. Most of physics is fraudulent. You're, you're ingrained in, in what you've been brought up to believe. You, you've been indoctrinated. I have a Bachelor of Science degree. I think I'm more knowledgeable on science than you are. Please tell me how you can stand upright everywhere on a ball. Gravity. Gravity. If, gra if, gra to the perpendicular to the if gravity existed, which is not unproven, and it could stick you, how does it make somebody upside down upright? Because how? it's a ball, so it's... How can anybody, why can't you model it then? Come here and show me. Show me how people can stand up everywhere. You can't model it, can you? If it was the truth, you could model it. How can a man stand upright on the bottom? He can't. Because you've got some, a pencil or something. Yeah. Right. You're up right there. Yeah. You're up right there. Yeah, you're turning the ball. The ball doesn't turn. Right there, but you're at the same time. Give me a man up right there and one of there at the same time. You can't. Yeah. Because, it's impossible. Because gravity takes you to the centre, perpendicular, straight line to the centre. So you're always upright, well, no why, matter where well, you are, you're well, always upright. Well, why can't you model it? Tell me why you can't model it. Tell me why you can't model the ship sailing around the world on there without going up or down hill. You can't. Because there is no up or down hill. It's a there scale. is no up or down hill. No. I've been up a hill and down a hill. That's, that's great. It's you're talking the planet. Super science now. That's great. That's what you've been indoctrinated. That's pseudoscience. That's pseudoscience. That's pseudoscience. It's pseudoscience. I'm a proper scientist. How does a plane fly around the earth? How do you think a plane flies around the earth? How does it fly around the earth level? How does he do that? How does gravity do that? Again, the same reason I've just explained why everything is upright because it's flying parallel to the surface. I'm also, I also have a pilot's license. Well, you'll notice that the horizon is always at eye level. Is it not? Is the horizon at eye level? Everything's at eye level. When well, it should be. That, that you should be looking that. down at the horizon. Eye level now. You should be looking down at the horizon. Okay. And I have seen a curvature of the Earth from up there. Well, I've shown you lots of pictures where it's... I've shown you pictures at 100,000 feet. There's no curvature. You've shown pictures of... Um, from, back, from balloons that have gone up to the maximum height they can go to. you just got the road to Blackpool. Stand on the prong, you'll see the earth is curved. You won't see it's curved, it's flat as a pancake. I've seen it curved. In your mind you have. What's the distance to the horizon? All right, you're saying that a plane flies around the earth. It's gonna, if a plane's going to fly around the earth, it's got to go like that round the ball, hasn't it? How else is it going to go around the earth? So if that plane's flying around there, it can't fly level. It's it can only fly level at the North Bloody Pole. It's parallel to the surface. So you can't model it, can you? Can you model it with a model? Can you model it with that ball there? You can't, can you? But you can with the flat Earth. Look. You can fly a plane level around the flat Earth, but you can't round the ball. So all your, all your arguments, none of them are modelled. You can't model them. Why is that? If that's the truth, it should fit the model, but it doesn't because it's a lie. You cannot prove a lie. Go and check it out. Yeah, it could be, yeah. They, I've seen that, yeah. Crow Treble 7. Yeah. 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 Like him, most people have been indoctrinated from birth to believe. You would have to have a stratum of people for... No, NASA now, yeah. The guy, Matt Boylan from NASA, he was, a, he was a graphic artist for NASA. He was employed to depict pictures of universes and planets and space. And he was at a meeting at the Hamptons, some posh place in, uh, in America. And over dinner, they told him, the Earth is flat. When was it decided? By Copernicus, who incidentally was a Freemason. He just made it up. And it was only published after he died. So the only thing is, if you take that as a, if we go and scale model, that's, a, that's the Earth. Your aeroplane would be the smallest speck of dust. It would, but it could still fly around each level, couldn't it? You can't, you show me how our plane can fly around this. Let's say you're going to fly from the North Pole to the South Pole and back again. That plane's got to fly upside down around the South Pole, hasn't it? It, 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 it 
could have it has to. Could only play around it if gravity was correct. You can't, you can't do it. It doesn't work. You're not standing, you're standing up right here. Well, you, everywhere you go, it looks like Imagine gravity is like a magnet. Then, then it works. And then they've done the bedford level experiment. Bedford level, yeah? Curvature of the earth, there's no curvature. Yes, there is, I've seen it. There isn't any curvature. Well, you go up here tomorrow, go up to Blackpool and look out to sea, you'll see it. You can see 60 miles across in America, yeah? It's been, I haven't brought the video with me. How can you see something 60 miles away if the curvature of the earth means it would be below where you're looking? How can you see it? No, this is, a, this is seeing it on the beach. You can see it's 60 miles away. Look, here's your evidence. Why are these planes in the southern hemisphere flying 14,000 miles when it's only seven? If it's really only seven, why are they doing it? Aviation feels expensive. Lady at the back, come on, explain this. Use your degree to tell me why they're going this crazy route. He's using one plane to go to three destinations as opposed to three planes to go to one destination. They don't do it in the northern hemisphere. They just go non-stop. It's because the, uh, the southern oceans are so much bigger. Put up your azimuth projection again. I've got something I want to discuss with you. Put up your azimuth projection. You so oh, that's the actual route. Right. Project this, is, this, is the, this is the actual map used by the USGS. OK, then explain yeah. to me then why, when you go from Britain to Australia, you go that way, then that way, and then over there rather than go straight that way. Hmm? I'm not talking about Australia, I haven't plotted that one on. Well, that's Australia, isn't it? No, it is, yeah. Yeah, but from Britain to Australia then. I've plotted it, I'm going with me. No, I'm saying... I don't know what the route is. It's from here to Dubai, then down to Malaysia, then across to Australia. Yeah, there isn't a problem with that route. You're saying that one's a straight line because it's a flatter. So why isn't this one a straight line? I haven't plotted it, I haven't plotted it. Oh, because it's, it's, it's not a straight line because you haven't plotted it. You, you explain it. this one to me. It's nonsense, isn't it? They're actually going, I've got it in black and white, they're going 14,000 miles. So I'm just going to explain that to you. But I'm, just, I'm trying to argue this one. Why then, if, if they go a straight line that way, if you think that's a straight line... Well, you line, can't show me what the route is. I've just told you it's from there well, I, I to Dubai. Show, it to me. show me the evidence. From there to, This is the way the aircraft flies. This is the, the route it takes. It goes from Heathrow to so Dubai, you, then across to um, Singapore, and then, and then up that way, so it's going a long way around instead of going straight across there. Doesn't make sense, does it? And it's... Is it true of you, Jan, saying you about airspace and uh, other countries and you can't... And it's still right. Yeah. You're telling me that air airline companies are going to use twice the jet fuel, three times the staff costs, three times the wear and tear on the airplane? Yeah, only in the southern hemisphere, but not in the. There's all, all most of the flights are non-stop in the northern hemisphere. It's only in the southern. That's because the Earth is flat. The one I've just explained to you, it goes from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere because Australia is in the southern hemisphere. In your, in your world, it is, yeah. And the in this world, yeah. In this world, yeah. Why does the USGS? Why does the USGS? Yeah, which do the, which do do all the map making in America? Why are they using the flat Earth model? It's just. A, why are they using it? They use the flat earth model. They don't use the ball earth model. All right. No, that's a fact. You can check it out. The USGS use the flat earth model. Pardon? Your, your academic qualifications don't mean jack shit to me. They're, not, they're worthless. Because they're all, they're, they're, all you're learning is what they want you to know. They don't want you to know the truth. Geography is telling you that you live on a ball. It's a ball. Yeah. In your world. You've been well indoctrinated. Well, I'll tell you. It's not a ball. Tell, tell me this. Tell me this. Why, do, why are NASA pretending to go into space? Why are they pretending? I presented it last time. Did I not show it last time, Rob? Yeah, I presented it last time. They're lying, they're making it up. Why are they doing that? Why does NASA need to employ a team of artists to depict space? If they've got the real thing, they wouldn't need artists. But they do, they employ them. Because they, they've got to make stuff up. Why does a rocket, yeah, 
go from vertical to horizontal within 30 seconds of launch every time. Every time. You can check it for yourself. This low, oh, they're all on, the, on YouTube. Why do they go vertical to horizontal 30 seconds later? They're not. They're going, they're going level with the flat earth. They're not, space is up. It's not that way. And why, do they, why do they turn the camera? Why do they turn the cameras off? So, Na so yeah, NASA, who brought all the Nazi people over, Operation Paperclip. You think they're an honest, good, to good, good, caring organisation? Why have they got the serpent tongue as their logo? Hey, eh? you trust NASA, do you? You trust their stuff, would you? Have you seen the pictures of Mars? Yes. Yeah. Have. have you seen the picture of the bobcat? Of the nuts and bolts of the pottery. Does it look like? Does it look like no, these are close up. You can see quite clearly what they are. The rocks. There's a squirrel on there. It's a rock. It's a Majavi ground squirrel. It's a rock. You believe there's something up there, do you? It's a rock. You're deluded. It's a rock. You're deluded. You probably believe in evolution, don't you? Yes. You do. So you believe that everything came out of nothing. I don't believe. A big bang. Out. You're talking terminology I'm not aware of. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. That's the point of the argument. But I've, sho I've shown you the roots. Do saying. those roots make sense to you? Uh, not the one, not the South American one, but the one you were showing the curved tracks does, yes. Which one? The one that you showed right at the earlier, earlier one this one. Well, I could show you countless ones. I've, I've done them. I haven't, because of limit, time limitations. All the Southern Hemisphere routes are all, all to pot. They're all two and three stops, taking 40 and 50 hours, where the, the, the cruising range of a big jet now is about 9,000 miles. They've all got them. So why are they taking three stops? The three stops I can't answer. I'm just saying that if you want to... And why can't you book the flight? You go home and try and book a flight. That's San, why are they using John Travolta? You try and book a flight from Santiago to Sydney, yeah? Qantas... You go and try and book that and then come and tell me about how you couldn't get it. Because you won't. Because it don't exist. Go and book it. Why would they make flights up that don't exist? You'd have to explain it in more, more simple terms. Right, Rob. I think we've just about done.